Hi, my name is Gary Scott. I'm excited to moderate today for um, the first panel of today, Enabling Density Where It's Needed Most. I've got um, Roberto uh, Requejo, um, the Executive Director of Elevated Chicago, Stephen Vance, the founder and CEO of Chicago Cityscape, and Catherine Darnstadt, the founding principal of Leighton Design. When we um, go over each uh, presentation, I'll do a bio at that time. So um, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Roberto uh, Requejo. Um, as I said before, he's the executive director of Elevated Chicago. Uh, Roberto is an urban planner and a diversity, equity, and inclusion DEI practitioner. As executive director of Elevated Chicago, he, is over, he has overseen $10 million in resources for ETOD, Equitable Transit Oriented Development, and has co-led co with Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office the creation of Chicago's first ETOD policy plan and pilot projects, including affordable housing, small businesses, public art, and grocery stores. Prior to joining Elevated, Roberto worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, the Chicago Community Trust, and the Metropolitan Planning Council. In 2021, Roberto was included in Chicago Magazine's New Power 30, a list of Chicagoans challenging the status quo and sparking make change. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Roberto. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Roberto Requejo. I'm the Executive Director of Elevated Chicago, and I had never seen so many people getting up early on a Monday to talk about zoning, and I'm having a moment. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, Elevated Chicago is a coalition of organizations advancing equitable transit-oriented development here in Chicago. We started in 2017 working around a half mile of seven CTA stations located in majority Black and majority Latinx uh, communities. And then in 2020, we expanded our footprint to many other areas in Chicago that want to have equitable transit-oriented development. We've met a lot of friends uh, along this way. And I want to acknowledge one of our founding mothers is here today, Jonna Trotter from uh, JP Morgan, pr prior with the Chicago Community Trust, which is our... Yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Um, and I'm saying this because this is a labor of love which required a lot of people to come together. And this is why I feel that in order to change zoning, uh, we need to do it together and as a coalition. It has to be very, very diverse. Um, we use ETOD to address racial inequities in our city. And we concentrate in inequities that we have encountered on health, public health indicators, also in climate change, resiliency indicators, and also in arts and culture indicators across Chicago, and we also use ETOD to stop uh, the displacement and the depopulation of communities of color um, across our city. So in this session today, uh, we'll be exploring the difference between TOD or transit-oriented development and ETOD that is very, very important uh, to us. We want to talk about the role that zoning plays in support uh, of uh, ETOD or, so, or sometimes to prevent uh, ETOD from happening. And finally, I want to touch on how our coalition is working to do something not as big as what Minneapolis has done, but something more incremental that we think is very important to do near, uh, near our transit stations. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of transit-oriented development, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, here. As you all know, the United States is a very, um, very uh, car-oriented in a country, and we have very car-oriented cities because we have planned those cities that way. We have intentionally planned our cities to be cities uh, for cars. And uh, transit-oriented development is a radically different way of building uh, neighborhoods that centers the needs of pedestrians and transit riders. And it also provides avenues and incentives to build cities that are more compact, that are more walkable, and neighborhoods that are better connected to active transportation options, right? So in theory, in theory, transit-oriented development should be more racially equitable than car-oriented development. And the reason for that is that 60% of the people who use um, transit are people of color. And the reason for that is also that uh, the car ownership rate is three times lower for black households than it is for white households. So in theory, you would think that when you build transit-oriented development, you would be doing this 
um, uh, for people of color. And the reality is very different from that. So uh, this is the, uh, the map that shows you what has happened in Chicago um, with TOD. Uh, Chicago has had a zoning ordinance that provides incentives for developers to build. Uh, I don't know why my slides are so jumpy this morning, by the way. Okay. Um, uh, Chicago has had an ordinance providing incentives to developers uh, uh, for building uh, near transit. It provides the um, developers increased density and number of units in near transit and reduces uh, or eliminates parking in sites located within a quarter mile of a train station. So all these incentives uh, since 2013 have produced thousands of homes closer to transit and jobs, but this has happened inequitably. And this map here shows you where TOD has been approved between 2016 and 2019. As you can see, 90% of transit-oriented development in the city took place in the north side, in the northwest side, in majority white uh, communities. Um, the Loop area, the West Loop, uh, Pilsen, South Loop. And as you can see, the rest of the city, the vast majority of our city, including this neighborhood and surrounding this area, has seen very, very, very little uh, transit-oriented development. What it has happened, uh, TOD has uh, produced gentrification and, and uh, displacement of people of color. So those dots that you see up there, especially in you know, Logan Square area, you are all probably very familiar with what's going on there, Pilsen, uh, same thing. And then TOD, as you can see, has also bypassed a lot of communities in the south and the west side. And in those communities, um, in those communities, um, displacement looks like uh, depopulation uh, of African-American neighborhoods where uh, com uh, families, uh, residents have left for better uh, opportunities. Um, here are some examples of the dysfunctions and the missed opportunities that we are seeing in transit-oriented development in Chicago. The left is a $300 million investment in a multimodal station at the end of one of our busiest lines, the red line. How many of you have been to this station, by the way? Great. So it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. There's a DJ booth and everything. So, right. Um, but uh, the investment was deployed without a TOD plan and without a community engagement process. So now the station, as you can see there, is surrounded by vacant lots and car-oriented uses. And this is not an exception. This is the norm in many, many stations in the south and the west sides of Chicago, a majority Latinx and black communities that have transit stations in very good shape and good service, but they are surrounded by vacant land and auto-oriented spaces. So that's one of the problems that we are trying to solve. The other problem is very different, and that's the right side of the slide. That is another um, very busy line, the blue line connecting O'Hare with uh, downtown. And this is the California station of the blue line. And as you can see, um, this, this, uh, the, in this community in particular, TOD, which looks like what you see at the bottom half of the, of the slide, looks like those buildings that have replaced that vibrant community that was Latinx, majority Latinx with a lot of um, small businesses. And now these buildings, these TOD buildings, may be more sustainable for sure, but are unaffordable to uh, Latinx um, um, families. And also the sizes of those units are not appropriate. So in Elevated, we have positioned our coalition very intentionally as a coalition to uh, solve these two problems, right? The problem of um, displacement that is happening triggered by gentrification. And in Logan Square, for instance, more than 25,000 people, Latinx people, have left the community in the past 20 years. But also the other side of displacement that is happening in the west and the south sides of Chicago, the depopulation of our uh, black communities uh, that have lost almost 300,000 people in the past uh, 20 years. We're doing this work with a very diverse coalition, as I mentioned, is comprised of institutional partners like the city of Chicago, um, uh, the Chicago Community Trust, our community foundation, CNT and MPC, a uh, couple uh, community development financial institutions, IFF and Enterprise, but more importantly, we also brought to the table several community-based organizations uh, uh, based on the communities most affected by these issues, from Logan Square Neighborhood Association to Garfield Park Community Council, Home and Square Foundation, and the Leo Institute. 
and others. And we wanted to bring together a coalition that was multiracial, but also multi-lens, because zoning should not be just for planners and for lawyers. It has to bring in the environmental uh, experts. It has to bring in the climate change experts, the public health experts, and the artists too, right? So uh, this is all uh, like a family effort to make sure that we get zoning right at uh, this time. And for us, uh, ETOD or Equitable Transit Oriented Development is both a process and an outcome. It's a process that centers the voice and the power of um, the people most affected by these issues and the voice and the power of communities of color we don't like to talk about community engagement. We like to talk about community ownership because one thing is to consult and bring people to a table. Another one is to provide people avenues to own the assets in their community. So that's the process. And the outcome looks like affordable housing, looks like small businesses, looks like business incubators, looks like a health clinics that we have been funding, supporting near transit in the past uh, five years. So if you have to summarize in just one sentence, ETOD is... Um, development <clears throat> without displacement and done uh, with communities and not to them. Um, when we created Elevated Chicago, uh, we knew that equitable TOD was really, really important to move up or to um, increase the indicators for racial equity, for public health, for uh, economic stability, and for climate change. And here are some data points for those of you who need the numbers. What we didn't know is how these four crises were going to come together and converging in 2020, if you think about it. A racial justice crisis, a public health crisis, climate change getting out of control, and a very, very unstable economy. And all that has lasted uh, to this day. And right now, we feel very, very strongly that there is not going to be an equitable recovery in Chicago without equitable transit-oriented uh, development. And the way we work, we, um, we have a work plan that our community-based partners have uh, created in collaboration with the members of our coalition. Uh, we're very place-based, and we invest in bricks and mortar, in walkability issues, in um, cultural activation, in green infrastructure near transit, because our transit also floods, like the one in New York is not as dramatic, but that, that happens too. Uh, but we don't work just with place. It's really important for us to work also with people and with process, right? And we build power in communities. We fund community tables. We support community benefit agreements. Um, and we also, our process side of the deal is all the work that we do targeting people who have power to change the rules that establish what gets built in neighborhoods and by whom. And all of our zoning work has been housed under that process um, um, system change uh, side of what we do. This is a more um, hopeful map than the one that I showed you earlier. So ever since we started Elevated, we've been um, supporting um, new TOD across the city, TOD with an E in front of it. And right now there is 20 plus, 30 plus ETODs that we are supporting across the city in collaboration with the city of Chicago. Um, and they look like, again, affordable housing, uh, food halls, grocery stores, business incubators, um, et cetera. And um, to do all this, uh, we have been five years in a journey, right? So we started in 2017. We created a work plan with our community-based partners. Um, and then in 2019, we had an opportunity to reform the existing transit-oriented development ordinance, the one that I told you doesn't work that great. At the time, we pushed to advocate and change the ordinance in two ways. We expanded to bus corridors to be also eligible for uh, incentives. But more importantly, we required the city to create an ETOD policy plan over 18 months. And over those next 18 months that, by the way, included a pandemic, we developed with our community partners and another 70 plus organizations a really comprehensive policy plan with 30 plus recommendations. <clears throat> that covered a very strong or a very um, broad a number of issues. And many of those recommendations that have been adopted unanimously by the Chicago Plan Commission, that have been supported by thousands of residents through the public comment period, require now the passage of a new ordinance, right? That changes zoning in a more comprehensive way than the prior ones. One thing that we are excited about is that the City Department of Housing, I think Daniel is here today. Thank you, Daniel and DOH are one of the early implementers 
of uh, the recommendations of the plan. They started by introducing uh, ETOD mandates within the affordable requirements ordinance. And then last year, they gave us this amazing Christmas gift at the end of the year by giving $800 million to 18 ETODs uh, across Chicago, the largest ever investment in ETOD in the city. Yeah. And uh, I make it sound very easy, but it was not. And it is not because each of those projects now requires a lot of work and a lot of financing and sometimes a lot of fight you know, in the neighborhoods um, that um, do not quite embrace ETOD the way uh, that we do. So um, let me ask now uh, in the city or in the, in the room here, how many of you have lived in a multifamily business, in a multifamily uh, home? Okay. And how many of you uh, used transit while you were living in that two flat or three flat or apartment building to get to and from? Okay, so big room, all of you uh, enjoy that. Uh, so all of you were very lucky. You should know this because in Chicago, multifamily buildings are banned in all of those, around all those station areas that you see in this slide. So buildings like the ones you see on the left side, that is, uh, type of building that is not even that big tower, right? It's just two flats, three flats, um, courtyard buildings, but planners called gentle density. Um, this, this is banned. We cannot build that near transit. Only single family is allowed uh, around the uh, station areas that you see here in the uh, brown line and the blue line. These are uh, affluent and middle-class majority white communities in Chicago. Thank you, Steve, Stephen, by the way. He created the maps that I'm showing you here. And what is allowed, though, is what you see on the right. So if you go to the station, sometimes you'll see there is an um, auto shop or there is a body shop or there is an uh, auto dealer or a gas station, and you're wondering what is this doing here, right? So on the one hand, you have to have only single-family homes. On the other hand, you can have those auto-oriented uses. How is this making any sense, right? So... So how do we change this? We need to change zoning. And when we talk about zoning, we have boiled down the challenges to these four, right? Um, number one is political will. We heard about this in the earlier presentation. This morning, we have uh, a lot of support from the mayor and the departments of housing, planning, transportation, public health, but we have 50 aldermen and women, and we need to convince at least 26. And we don't have that yet, or we're not sure, right? So how do we make sure that we bring in the political will from city council to pass new ordinance that uh, deals with these issues? Uh, the other obstacle is that this is a very obscure topic, and many of us get excited about zoning, and we love, but this is not fun stuff. We don't know how to talk about it. We bore people to death. So we need great storytellers for this. We need real stories from real people translating this into art, into... Um, in numbers that make sense to people, not just to statistics experts, etc. Inertia is a third obstacle. I think in Chicago, I've met many people that have never met anything other than a car-oriented neighborhood, right? If you have only seen that your entire life, how are you going to imagine something different, right? In many communities, actually, they have to own a car. You know, this is not that they have choices in some places. So that inertia in the system is very hard uh, to change. And finally, NIMBYism, I'm not going to go too, uh, too deep into this. You've seen uh, many community meetings, you present ETOD and you hear, you know, uh, concerns about traffic, concerns about the schools being overtaxed, um, concerns about the type of people who are going to move in the community. A lot of times these concerns uh, hide uh, racist and classist um, biases. Those are the four things that, by the way, I'm going to leave that out for a minute because we're going to need your help all of you in helping with all those four things, if we want to change zoning in Chicago. So how can we um, change equity, resiliency, health, and the economy all at the same time with zoning, right? So the way to do it is changing the ordinance. I'm going to show you a little bit of the campaign that we're working on with uh, the city of Chicago. It says Nick Preview is still kind of drafty, so do not post this anywhere other than um, your close circles. But we thought to do something different this time and make it, uh, first of all, we wanted a campaign that was um, based on what we heard throughout the policy plan creation. We heard thousands of people telling us things based on storytelling, marrying that storytelling with the data and simplifying what we need to the E, the T, and the D 
that you see in the in the description here of what ETOD is. So one of the things that we heard many times, and this is from a community resident, is that the issues that come up consistently are traffic, uh, parking, density, and it's vitally important that these issues are addressed right up front. So that's one thing that we are trying to do uh, with these changes in the new in the new ordinance. Um, this is from a, a neighbor in Logan Square as she uh, was looking at a construction site on a parking, a parking lot that is now uh, affordable housing. She used to see a parking lot and now she sees hope, future and opportunity. That's one of the stories that we want to collect and we have been collecting. And in terms of the data, people who live in uh, TOD areas save up to 23% uh, of costs. So imagine what that means uh, for, for a family, especially low income working Family. So goal number one for the new ordinance is more equity. So the E of ETOD, more equity. And here is where we want the city to change the ban that exists on multifamily housing in um, transit stations and allow for a variety and a diversity of types of homes uh, near, the, near those, uh, those transit hubs. Another type of story that we heard is the, how dangerous it is to get to and from transit stations and uh, it's not only the um, it's not only the traffic violence that exists in those areas; it's police brutality that exists in those areas. It's gang violence. It's, it's a lot of things, right? Um, we wanted to collect stories uh, about this and data too, right? And this is a very heartbreaking fact that last year we lost 83 Chicagoans in uh, to traffic violence. In um, sorry about that. Within the half mile of a train station, this is data from the city of Chicago, 83 people killed in the proximity of a train station. So we need to stop that. And so the second part of the goals that we have uh, for the new ordinance is more transit orientation near uh, transit hubs, safer, uh, more lighting, less uh, auto-oriented uses, less car cuts, etc. And finally, another set of stories that we heard from people we're about the need for better and more incentives, right? And this is a quote from one of our members of our coalition, Guillaume Foreman, developer. Building more homes and retail spaces near transit is vital for the South Side, but we need more and better incentives. And one example of that shows how important it is, this is, is like only in the three years that I showed the map uh, earlier uh, in the presentation, 75,000 jobs were created. In Chicago. So that TOD created 75,000 jobs. Imagine if we were able to expand that to the west and the south sides. So, uh, the, so the third goal for the ordinance is more development. So we talk about more equity, that's the E, more transit orientation and safety, that's the T, and more development, that's the D. One of the things that we want to do is to expand the incentives that right now is only for a quarter mile from the stations to a half mile to each station, which will almost double the amount of land eligible for these uh, incentives and also to expand to high frequency bus corridors. So I'm gonna stop my super jumpy presentation here. And um, with that, I'm gonna let the next speaker come to the podium or to speak from the chair, whatever you prefer. Thank you. You can bring me the clicker, you can go off there. Can you bring me the clicker? So just while we're transitioning for five seconds, um, this is Stephen Vance, uh, founder and CEO of Chicago Cityscape. Stephen Vance is an urban planner who founded Chicago Cityscape, a real estate information website and consulting business. He also consults on zoning for map strategies. He graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago's College of Urban, Stud urban Planning and Public Administration, CUPA worked at the Chicago Department of Transportation, the Active Transportation Alliance, and Streets Blog Chicago. He's a member of ULI, Chicago's chapters ADU Task Force, uh, Lambda Alpha International ELI chapter, and the Metropolitan Planning Council, MPC's Land Use Committee. So um, I'll pass it over to Thank you. Uh, is my mic working? I think it is. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about hashtag unused zoning um, so unused zoning capacity is the difference between 
the number of dwelling units that you have on site now and the number of dwelling units that the zoning district for that site would allow without a zoning change. And so that's a really key thing, without a zoning change. Uh, and I'll come back to that. So in Chicago, um, you can actually calculate that pretty easily. You'd have to take the lot area, and then you look at the zoning district, then you look through the zoning code, and you say, what is the minimum lot area per unit? Got that? Um, and so these two examples on, on are two tweets that I posted. So I use social media to try to highlight these examples. And, uh, and one of the things that, that Roberto put on his slide is that obscure topic. And so like, I like dedicating my time and my maps to, to dispelling um, or helping people understand obscure topics. And I think one of those is unused zoning capacity. So the building on the right, which is a really common three flat design in Chicago, got a, the owner got a permit to build a fourth unit. And that one was really easy to, to understand how they were able or allowed to do that, is that you can kind of tell that it looks like an oversized lot. And so most lots in Chicago are 3,125 square feet. Uh, a really common zoning district allows three units. So you basically just divide 3,125 by 1,000, you get three. And so on an oversized lot, we can, I can just assume, I can just guess by looking at this, it's probably a 4,000 square foot lot. So thus it has three now, but it can have four in the future. Or, or actually, it's already permitted, so hopefully it's getting built right now. And so why I, I talk about these things, uh, so I'm an urban planner, then I started studying policy, then I learned how to make maps, like, and, and I, I made maps for many of you in the audience, uh, and also that'll be on some other people's slides. And then I also like to use cats to help me out. So I'm teaching Alice here how to how to make how to use QGIS. So if you don't know how to use QGIS, it's the best free software for map making out there. <clears throat> so what I, I know or claim to know and what I believe um, are that Sony maps are really awful to look at uh, and to study. Um, but I like, I like doing that now. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear uh, the keynote speaker at the end, um, uh, Sarah, talk about uh, zoning maps across the country. Um, then I also do zoning assessment. So a zoning assessment is um, where, you, where you study the zoning code and how it applies to a specific property. And so I've done this, I, I do this as kind of a, like a freelance work. Um, uh, property owners will hire me to to es essentially write a report that says, here's what's allowed at that property. Here's what they're allowed to build. Here's what they're allowed to expand to. My favorite ones are like, here's this property. I want to build this thing. I know the zoning code doesn't allow it. So what is the strategy to move forward from the current code to, to something else that would allow this thing that I want to build? Um, I, I'm that's like really obscure in itself. Um, one example is an esports stadium. So I helped work with a, a company that will be developing the first esports stadium in Chicago in the South Loop. Um, that was approved by Plan Commission last year. So I designed a zoning strategy to get that to be allowed. Um, and then I also do a lot of data analysis. So love collecting data. Uh, so I built ChicagoCityscape.com which aggregates data from over 130 sources on a, in a daily basis. Um, and, and then I sell, I resell that information. Uh, we also have a lot of sponsored memberships. So even if you can't afford it, I got you covered. Uh, and then I also believe that single family only zoning is bad. It's actually absurd uh, to legally mandate a specific type of housing that uh, we have now figured out is like really bad for the environment, really great for segregating our communities. So where is this unused zoning capacity? Uh, it's everywhere you see on the map that is colored in purple, either shade of purple. Um, and then it's, it's not available in those circled areas that uh, Roberto showed along the blue line to O'Hare and the brown line uh, after Belmont. So between like Belmont and Kimball, that's where there's a lot of not unused <laughs> zoning capacity, um, except where there is an ADU pilot area. So I'll get to that in a second. 
And then I've also highlighted or mentioned LaSalle Street on here. So LaSalle Street, if you read Cranes, has been mentioned many times in the last six months. Uh, and I'm talking about the portion of LaSalle Street between Jackson, uh, where the Board of Trade building is, all the way up to about um, Lake Street or Wacker Drive, and, and what is commonly known as our, our financial district. Um, a lot of businesses have moved out of that section. And so like BMO Harris Bank built a brand new tower next to Union Station. And so they'll be moving a lot of their employees over there. Bank of America moved out to a brand new tower they built on Wacker. So a lot of employees will be moving there as well. Um, and so there's there's all this now empty space and and like banks are now taking over rather than foreclosing. They're, they're taking possession of these buildings. And so like as a business community in Chicago, they're like, this is not good. And so there's already been tons of action on it. Like ULI, the Urban Land Institute, has uh, created a task force. They've already uh, put out their recommendations. Um, the planning de city's planning department is planning to do a study to find which are the 10 to 15 most redevelopable or convertible buildings. But then when you look at the zoning map, it's actually already perfectly zoned for high density housing. Um, if they're not in a planned development, which has a lot of uh, restrictions that are in a, in a specific document, then they're in a DX zone, which is my favorite zone. So if, if you look through the zoning code, this is the best one because it allows pretty much everything uh, that can be allowed um, in a city. It doesn't allow manufacturing, though. Um, the X stands for mixed use, so downtown mixed use. So these office buildings can be converted to residential today. You'd have to hire an architect, and you'd have to get some funding, and then you can convert uh, these office buildings to to housing. And some of them are really great for conversions, like the 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 pre modernism buildings. Um, uh, they're structurally like they're laid out better for for conversion to apartments. Um, so so when I talk about unused zoning capacity, it also sounds like ADUs because accessory dwelling unit ordinances here and across the country basically say, doesn't matter what the current zoning on your property is, you still get to build at least one apartment. Uh, and then contextually, it may be two apartments because um, of certain rules that we have here in Chicago. Um, they typically take the form of basement units, of attic units. Uh, you can even do a rear addition. Uh, they also are small backyard houses, usually coach houses. Coach meaning like a car or a horse. Um, and a buggy. Um, this one on the screen is one of the first to be completed since accessory dwelling units were re-legalized last year. Um, and so I believe that ADUs are a kind of unused zoning capacity, but they're not, ADUs are not available or allowed everywhere in Chicago because the way the city council adopted the legislation last year is that it was limited to five pilot areas. And, and so uh, a couple of the differences also are um, with the ADU, your it's it's smaller area. So the map I showed that had the two shades of purple, the ADU was the smaller of the two areas where there is unused zoning capacity. Um, one downside of unused zoning capacity. So let's say I want to build two apartments right now um, because. I've done the math of that minimum lot area per unit calculation. And I see that, oh shoot, I have to build one parking space for those two units. I, I don't have space on my lot for two parking spaces. Um, and there is probably not relief. Uh, usually there's not relief with the zoning code with or with the uh, zoning board of appeals, which is where relief uh, from code is granted to property owners. Um, the other thing about ADUs is that it's available only in residential areas, whereas unused zoning capacity, it's available in mixed-use districts, in what we call our B and our C districts, which are arterial streets like uh, Belmont Avenue or Chicago Avenue. So there is unused zoning capacity on top of the storefronts there as well. Uh, and actually, um, in looking through the building permits in the last two years, uh, there are 125 new apartments that are being built where there were none before in existing buildings. And that was uh, because of unused zoning capacity. Um, there are another difference between the two. Unused zoning capacity does not have an affordability requirement. So you can build 
uh, and the, uh, the number of apartments allowed uh, and then rent them at any rent that you want. Whereas with the ADU ordinance, if you build more than one apart, uh, ADU, you have um, a requirement to have rent half of those uh, as affordable. And then there's also this thing called the ADU multiplier, which I just made up. Um, you can actually use both. You can use your unused zoning capacity and ADU ordinance to build even more units on an existing, uh, in an existing building or in an existing parcel. And so I've actually seen um, a few property owners do this. So a property owner has unused zoning capacity and is in an ADU pilot area, but is choosing to permit their new apartment uh, or their additional apartment through the unused zoning capacity pathway in the zoning code rather than the ADU pathway. And I don't really know why, except that they can perhaps unlock the ADU addition later and build a backyard house. So that's another limitation of the accessory dwelling unit ordinance in Chicago is you can't build both an interior unit and a backyard house on the same property. But if you build your interior apartment through the unused zoning capacity, you can still later build the backyard house. So I like that, and that's what I call the multiplier. So you can uh, find it all across Chicago, like I said. Um, you, you need two maps. Uh, you need your zoning map, and you need a parcel map. Um, and you need the Cook County Assessor's data. Uh, I saw that we have one uh, person from that office, so I'm really excited to talk to them later, hopefully. The assessor has great data, uh, and the, the current administration in the assessor's office has done a lot better at, at getting more data out there. And so we, so I, so I can look at Woodlawn along 63rd Street, so that's what this map is showing. Um, this includes the section that has the TOD bus corridor. So Roberto mentioned that we expand the TOD ordinance to be uh, include a lot of bus corridors as well, which doubled the size of our TOD eligible area in Chicago. And it also includes the King Drive and Cottage Grove Green Line stations. So mixing or adding the two maps together, I calculated that there are 4,038 units that could legally be built right now without any zoning changes. And so that may sound pretty amazing, like, oh my gosh, like Woodlawn, we could totally add, we could add 4,000 units right now without having to do like major new construction or encounter NIMBYism. I'll get to why that, that's not that great, actually. <laughs> um, so here are some groups that I think should be taking advantage of unused zoning capacity, and I'll explain why I'm limiting it to these groups. Well, first of all, the homeowners. Like, great, you can earn some extra income by building a new apartment. Um, however, you may not want to be a landlord. Uh, community land trusts um, sh and shared limited equity developers, um, similar groups here, um, so this picture is the first acquisition of the Here to Stay Land Trust um, on the northwest side. And it's a single family house, but like, what if there could be two more units? So look at, this un look at the zoning code and determine, is there unused zoning capacity here? Because it may not be in an ADU pilot area. Uh, and with the land trust being kind of a, a moderator of, of the property, like it's always involved, even though it's owned by the occupant. There's like a, a shared resource there to hire architects, hire general contractors to do uh, management as a group. Uh, and then MMRP, that's the micro market recovery program that the city of Chicago uh, administers. It is a funding program, mostly for um, down payment assistance. And it's only available in 11 areas. But again, each of those 11 areas has a local manager contracted by the city to administer the grants. So it's another great uh, way to centralize management and have a shared resource because relying on uh, 4,000 homeowners in Woodlawn to, to execute and build apartment is not probably not gonna happen. Um, so we've got some advantages. Uh, like I said, it's available right now. So Woodlawn could you know, have those 4,000 units, get them permitted next week. Um, it is widely available across Chicago uh, and especially in high resource areas. So Lincoln Park, um, considering a high resource area, high resource means a lot of amenities, a lot of good transportation, um, uh, higher quality schools. Um, and that's, that's exactly where we need more housing uh, and also where housing uh, or where there's a lot of resistance to new housing. 
Another advantage is that it's unsu unsubsidized. So the city doesn't really need to devote a single dollar to build any of these units. Uh, it also helps us redensify. Uh, I said there's an income component and it's cheap. Um, to build a new or to build an interior apartment is uh, about a third of the cost is building a backyard house. Uh, there are some disadvantages, so I'm actually contradicting myself. It's expensive. <laughs> um, it, it depends on who you are and your income level and your ability to obtain financing. Uh, financing is very difficult for pretty much any type of new construction if you're not uh, rich. Um, accessing loans for $100,000 to $300,000 is, is, is also expensive. I'm actually trying to do that myself. I bought a two-flat, trying to rehab it very hard. <laughs> um, another disadvantage is that it's scattered. So there's kind of a, a management issue um, to, to, to rely on on uh, tens of thousands of inputs to, to develop the housing rather than, you know, uh, like the Department of Housing uh, awarded LIHTC grants to 18 different projects. Those 18 projects are going to generate many times more housing than relying on unused zoning capacity. And then structure. So not everybody, not every house is is a bit, is able to be added onto or converted. Um, so actually, those two pictures go together. This one and this one. So Monica Chata and her husband bought this six flat and were able to add two units uh, to the basement and didn't have to do any excavation of the basement floor to get a deep enough uh, ceiling height. And so I'm, I'm really excited as, uh, for unused zoning capacity. People are already taking advantage of it. It's, it's so prevalent across Chicago. Um, not enough people are taking advantage of it who I think could be taking advantage of it. And, but as a policy, as a citywide policy, I just don't think it's reliable. However, I think there are a few ways that uh, we can make it better. Um, so like when I said scattered, so having a more centralized management system uh, of, a, of sharing resources. So finding a general contractor for yourself is already hard enough, but like, what if, you know, neighborhood housing services already works with a lot of general contractors to, who are um, part of their own funding programs? Like share um, your recommendations on who the great general contractors are. And then there are no incentives for this um, so you can get an incentive for a down payment assistance. You can get a grant from the city to replace your furnace with a higher efficiency one. You can get a grant to replace the roof, which is all great for maintaining a building, but none of the grants are big enough or are allowed to cover additional unit construction. Um, the only incentive I can really think of is with the assessed value of the house, uh, when you make certain home improvements, uh, 75,000 of your assessed value increase because of the improvement uh, is exempted, but only for four years. And so that number of $75,000 has not been updated in a while and doesn't, may not cover the cost or, well, also it's not, it, Never mind. I'm, I'm going to go into a rabbit hole of assessments if I, if I keep talking. Um, maybe we should change that number. Uh, so I hopefully have shown that uh, unused zoning capacity is a real thing. Um, and is prevalent across Chicago, and thousands of units could be built because of it. And no city council action is needed, and we don't need city council money, although it could be useful. But as a housing production policy, it probably is not the most reliable. So we probably are just going to keep chugging along with a, maybe 100, 200 units per year, just, just kind of uh, flying under the radar. And so that is the end. Um, oh, so search that hashtag, uh, and you'll find dozens of other examples. Um, and if you need a map, uh, ask me. The big one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, Catherine, who's sitting to my left. Uh, Catherine Darnset. Uh, she's the architect and founder of Layden Design, an award-winning urban design practice at the intersection of architecture and community development, creating social, economic, and environmental impact beyond the building, leveraging design as a tool to make the invisible forces impacting a project visible through architecture. The firm's collaboration range from small-scale tactical interventions 
new construction community buildings, adaptive reuse, neighborhood master plans, and design speculations throughout the Midwest. She has been featured and published nationally as an AIA Young Architects Honor Award, Crane Chicago 40 Under 40, uh, Venice uh, Biennale, and previously taught at the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Northwestern University. So uh, let's give her a hand to get started. Here's Thanks, Catherine. everyone. <laughs> All right, so um, I promise no math on this one. Um, and I get, I, as the architect, I get to show some pretty pictures. I did see that there was a hand in the background for a question, so I'll make sure that someone gets you uh, right first um, when we get to Q&A. But as an architect, so there were a couple things just we look at at latent design is always how can we explore the influence of design as small or as large as the context allows. We're working on several ETOD developments currently, three on Chicago Avenue that utilizes the bus route as ETOD. It's not just transit stops, it's also a high frequency bus route. So if you know that, then the, so much more of the city starts to open up to you as possibilities. Uh, we're working on Holman and Harrison that Roberto mentioned with IFF, and we even proposed a 100% affordable housing unit down in the loop. We were part of the one of the finalists for C40. And so with that, it starts to frame how we look at design and zoning and all of these things that the obscure topic allows us to push as designers. But today, I'm going to talk about single family homes and what's happening in Chicago. Um, I also agree with Stephen that this isn't the best blanket zoning to have in many of our our neighborhoods, but there are ways that people and developers and designers are pushing that further um, to look at different housing models and see what's possible, both at the, in the realm of affordability with different affordable housing developers and within the private market as well. Um, this presentation, Singles Bar, Single Family Zoning, uh, Singles Bar, because it's low, and that's how I came to the title today. Um, but <laughs> if you want to know more about us, um, as mentioned, we're, we're thinking about, you know, this city as, um, you know, form follows policy. I learned, I went to IIT that, you know, form follows function, but it really follows policy and it really follows insurance. And those are pieces that, you know, Stephen and Roberto opened up with. And so those are the biggest constraints that we're a part of um, and we're thinking through. And we're still living on this legacy of Leave It Town, right? Of how did we get to the single family picket house as our ideal, as an individual? I mean, it, it blankets our cities, it blankets our neighborhoods, it blankets our suburbs. It's both inclusionary and mostly exclusionary at the same time. But this is a legacy that is still very much referenced. Um, you could look at even the housing policy that the White House just came out with this morning is still kind of referencing, you know, how do we create homes that actually are affordable to the market and the salaries that people are coming out of? We're taking so much effort and time to um, incentivize um, development of single family homes, but then we're also taking time to talk about how it's also conversely very unaffordable. So two things in my mind need to happen. We need to be looking at ways that we rethink what affordable housing means. Um, you know, we talk about this missing middle type of housing. That missing middle is this gap housing um, in terms of people who are making a certain income of uh, a certain income per year. Um, and that missing middle housing we hear in multiple different neighborhoods and multiple different cities is the area that needs. That's that gentle density that was talked about earlier, whether it's a more affordable single family home on the market, like this one on the screen, Hem House by Future Firm in Garfield Park. Um, or is it more about creating and, and keeping two flats, three flats and stopping deconversions or de-incentivizing deconversions so we keep that natural afford, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing as that other term is known. This house, um, you'll, you'll kind of see a glimpse of it later on and I'll, I'll see if you can recognize the form um, later on in the presentation. It, it could be between 1,400 and 25 hundred square feet. So we're talking, you know, this is a, a at 1400, 1500 square feet. That's relatively small, but it's a, a well designed home, but it hit the market at, at about 350 K. So the question is technically that's missing middle. 
Uh, but is that affordable for that neighborhood? And then what is that? Is this like a, a beautifully designed? It's award winning. Everything we love about it as architects. It's grayish. We love it even more. Um, you know, and so how what what are we starting to look at? The other one um, uh, where you're seeing also on the west side, we're both a, it connects is in North Lawndale and a couple other areas is the the siren song of modular housing um, that where we've had in a couple variations already in Chicago. We've gone through our own booms and busts with uh, modular housing construct construction as well as nationally. That is also happening um, with, uh, with modular housing contractors because, you know, we hear it over and over and over as designers and you heard it in even some of the presentations. It's really expensive to build. It was even expensive to build before everything suddenly became unavailable and it's even more expensive now. And so where are there ways to have efficiencies within both design and then understanding a supply chain and the constructability of a home and making it, uh, possible to increase uh, or decrease the time that it takes to construct a home. So going from a vacant lot to a finished home, what does that look like? First in a shop, so Connects Modular is, these are homes constructed in a shop uh, based on modular components. So it's a series of stacked uh, stacked cubes together um, that come together very quickly on a site. Uh, they have cool videos on their website if you go and see that. And they pull together very quickly and then ultimately transform, reduce the amount of site work because that work is pushed into a, uh, a warehouse, into a interior environment to build it. Connects, um, these also have a range of sizes from 1800 to 20, 2500. So again, we're looking, you're seeing a trend that new homes coming out are more efficiently designed, smaller, but really bespoke rooms. And that in turn is one way that we're getting to a lower price point of affordability. Some of the first ones on the market since they were uh, subsidized through affordable housing developers were hitting around 250 or so. Um, other ones as they go to market rate, we'll see what they start to come out as. Because I think all of them are not, there's no market rate. Are they all? There are three market rate in South Shore for sale right now. At? I think it was listed at 450. There we go. Now we know we're at, we're at 450 for the same home. Um, so thinking about that, um, that's a $200,000 price difference. And I'm going to tell you another $200,000 price difference between affordable and market rate with the same design. So this is Trace Lotes in Bronzeville um, by Via Architects uh, Chicago. Um, so you see the rendering on the left and the final on the right. It's a beautiful uh, slab on grade uh, home that has three bedrooms, two baths, um, about 1,500 square feet. So you, you get the trend. $428,000 that that just sold for, the first one out of the three. You take that same home um, and you take away the bay and you take the hardy board and change it from black to red. It's a Habitat for Humanity home in South Shore or Greater Grant Crossing that goes for $225,000. So they, it's, you know, we're starting to see, so is the, is the market trend matching the trend that we see within housing across the city that affordable that affordable developers are working at. What I'm what I see in my work is that um, they're they're the same, and we're but we're talking about them differently. We're putting still different stigmas to them, and we're we it can't be a two hundred thousand dollar price difference only on location and whether you have a waterfall edge in your island or not. Um, there's other factors going on here that we need to you know strongly consider and look at. Um, and whether it is um, still the goal of single family housing that we want to look at, or do we want to think about this in other terms of density? You know, Stephen talked about ADUs. Um, we're working on several ADU projects and we're working on even more ADU projects that died. And the reason is this cost. So right now, um, a new construction ADU, it's a very simple design overall. Um, it's $250,000 new construction. That's a lot. We worked on another one that was in South Shore, same price, um, different design, had a perfect lot, extra wide, extra deep, had all the unused zoning capacity that Stephen talked about. So this was just a slam dunk for them to be able to do it. Got an FHA loan for it. The loan does not cover how much it's cost. The loan will never cover how much it's going to cost because that cost is never going to come down. And so you have these opportunities that we talk about in the zoning sense. We have to create more opportunities in the fiscal sense to actually make that happen. Um, 
And, you know, when in doubt, look to Texas. Uh, if you want to know what's the, what's the next thing you're going to see in single family housing, um, Lennar Home, biggest home builder in the country. This is their newest product that they're putting on the market. It is uh, 350, 350 square feet at $155,000 uh, uh, ask. It's pretty similar design of the hem house. It's got the pivot, the, the two angled roof. It's very nice, you know, overall. But that is their version of what a mobile home will look like. And you also are starting to see even in the announcement from the White House today that Fannie Mae and other housing lenders are starting to look at mobile homes as part of a pipeline of housing, but they're looking at it specifically to start to change the way that the loan process was. The problem with mobile homes, they're cattle loans, so you don't have access, you don't own the land, you barely own the, the structure itself. So how does you know this type of housing fit within an arc of affordable housing um, across the country itself? In Chicago, um, outside of ADUs, we can't do tiny homes. I know there was, we there was we tried that once. Uh, <laughs> I think in Chicago, so we can't even build this small in Chicago if we wanted to. Um, and then finally, this is the other realm. This also um, this is in Texas. This is Lake Flatow's Icon Home. It is a 3D printed concrete home. It is 2,000 square feet. Um, I have no idea how much it costs. It costs, costs DARPA fund level of money. But this is also another piece of housing that is it is also driving federal policy. A week or so ago, the White House also came out with um, an announcement for funding for 3D printing in general. This is what's supposed to take us to Mars. This is the next form of housing. This is the next form of housing that will be flood resistant, tornado resistant, climate change resistant. I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but it's very pretty and it's award-winning home overall. So will we see 3D printed homes in Chicago sometime? I don't know, but maybe, um, you know, we'll, we'll start to think about what, you know, how design um, has to either lead or can we lead and can we lead the design of policy, which is one of the pieces uh, my two peers up here talked about, or can we do the design of policy and can we have that design actually be more important than the design of the object itself? Thank you. I think I'll walk around and um, answer oh, questions the there corner. and start in the back. <laughs> so, um, and if you could say your name and uh, fun fact. Um, <laughs> my name is Chiaka Patterson, fun fact. I'm uh, a sailor. Um, but more importantly, I'm a developer, and um, as it relates to this form. So my question is, as I try to better understand this ADU ordinance change, I think it's a there's some recent changes, right? Um, I was involved with a project where the owner of a multifamily apartment building in Beverly Morgan Park was trying had plenty of space in the in the basement and wanted to expand um, into additional units and the architect consultant said that that was not an option and so I'm wondering I think you maybe mentioned that it's a pilot there's a pilot going on and so perhaps those areas are not included or or how is is there a dividing line between what multifamilies can be expanded to add additional units in the basement or what's or not. Yeah, so there's there are five pilot areas and there's actually two charts outside in the hallway that outline where those pilot areas are really effectively. I know we had a map Stephen had a map up um, but that's easier to look at. When it comes to, were they base they were basement ADUs that they wanted garden units essentially that they want to expand into. So if it's not the pilot area, it's the ceiling height. And so the ceiling height has to be a certain height over the majority of the space. And if it's not, then you have to excavate your existing basement slab lower in order to meet that criteria. The ceiling heights were fine, then I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I can't speculate as the reason then. Yeah. Well, but, I, oh, I, go ahead. I have one more speculation. Yeah. That your architect wasn't aware. But they are, not all architects are 
designing equally. <laughs> it, yeah, that's fair too. Um, I think we we've we've worked on several um, basement ADUs that stop, so we get a lot of calls because we're out. Stephen does have a really nice ADU list of architects and contractors on the website who are working in this area. What we found with basement units um, is if they don't have enough height, it is very expensive to lower your foundation slab. It's cost prohibitive, or there might, um, many people already have tenants in the space um, and they were hoping that they could just take advantage of the ADU ordinance to legalize the unit that they're already renting. And this happens all over the city. Um, and when they find out they have to do something, some extreme construction, then they kind of just go away. You don't have to under the ADU ordinance. So that's that's the, the big piece, right? So if you're adding another unit, you don't have to have that one-to-one -one parking ratio that would exist otherwise. Yeah, so everything is layered here. So I said there was an ADU multiplier. So uh, an ADUs don't require parking, but unused zoning capacity most likely requires parking. But if you're in a B or a C district and near one of the TOD bus routes, then you could use your unused zoning capacity to add the units and use the TOD to not add the parking. <laughs> Hi, um, this is sort of for all three of you, but more for the gentlemen who are talking about neighborhoods and, and growing capacity density. So I'm an advocate for school reform and for parks. And when you look at buildings and you look at lots and you want to increase density, are you also concerned about you know, schools getting overcrowded or parks not having enough room for their programming because more and more people are living in a community? And there are many communities across the city here where the parks don't have enough room or enough athletic facilities for the people who are there, or the neighborhood itself doesn't have the, the uh, housing that it should so that that park is better used. So I was wondering if you guys consider school issues and park issues when your advocacy for denser, you know, more density in the housing. Do you have a response? I, I can start. Um, so the work that we do in Elevated is very much uh, community-based and we follow the directions of our community partners on what what they need and what they want, right, for that particular half mile around each area. We work in seven what we call equitable hubs, the half mile around uh, the station. Some of the areas may have that issue that you talk about. Some of the areas that we work on do not have uh, that issue whatsoever. Um, and also one thing that we always keep in mind is to do what several speakers today have talked about, which is step back a little bit and look at why is it that your schools are at capacity in that community and what is it that your park sucks, right? And how much of that relies, not necessarily, it's not a problem of the density of the neighborhood, but it's a problem of how, where do we put funding? Mm -hmm. You know, where do we not put funding, etc. cetera. Um, like we would not necessarily penalize a community that has been uh, traditionally disinvested by not bringing more density just because the park district or the schools have been closed or have been overcrowded or have been uh, disinvested by the people who are trying to uh, influence to get out of power and to bring power from community into those, those spaces. So again, we start with what the community wants. If the community says our, our um, uh, schools are overcrowded, we definitely listen to that. One example um, where um, the schools are highly mobilized is Logan Square. And in that community, what people came and said is that, yes, we have issues with our schools, and yes, we have very little park space, but we do want 100 units of affordable housing in this parking lot. We want mm -hmm. more people to come to the community and we want our people to have space here. So that's, that's how we work, but again, it's, it depends very much on where you work, and it also comes with this baggage in Chicago of why is it that that school or that park is having that problem. Mm -hmm. so, I would say a lot of schools are under-enrolled. Um, yeah. And also remember that Chicago used to have a million more people in mm -hmm. 1957 than it does mm -hmm. today. Uh, so like our city's infrastructure was built out for that many. I mean, not everybody lived as well, or there may have been a lot of 
terrible housing and, and uh, worse living conditions. Um, with the schools, that's interesting because um, the policy that I'm pushing here, it takes a lot of time for any units or people to be noticed that they moved in. Um, but a more recent example is there's a new apartment building next to the Cumberland Blue Line station that was recently approved, 297 apartments, 59 or 60 of them are gonna be affordable. And so one of the reasons why people pushed back on that one was it was gonna overcrowd a specific school. Um, one that this, the public schools had already, I believe started building an annex to. So they were like already preparing for this so-called influx. And then the, the developer uh, commissioned a school enrollment study, which I believe some staff at CPS validated. And they, would, they predicted that only 30 new students would be generated by, by 300 apartments. Oh, even less than 30 new students. And so like, I think CPS can handle over the next five years at one school a potential influx of zero to 30 students um, in a very high resourced neighborhood uh, of, of O'Hare. <laughs> That's the community area that this project mm -hmm. is in. Um, yeah. Uh, with parks, I don't really have a comment. I don't really follow how it, it intersects with parks. Hi, my name's Brandon. Um, I'm a grad student at UIC's MUP program. Um, also do some housing justice organizing in South Shore, where I'm from. Um, my question is for Roberto um, regarding um, Elevated. I'm curious how you all decide what kinds of EDO, ETOD programs you all support, especially in like black, black and brown neighborhoods on the south and west side. Um, in um, South Shore, the latest ETOD pro project or maybe the first, I don't, I, probably the first, um, is on 79th, it's Invest Southwest project on 79th and Exchange, um, but they're building 24 condos, 40 apartments, most of which are market rate, and the median income in the neighborhood is $32,000. Right, yes. So um, the way we choose uh, projects that we support, programs that we support is, uh, when I was uh, talking before, I talked about ETOD, ETOD being not only an outcome, but also a process, right? And the outcome may be fantastic, but if the process, you know, isn't there, that's not going to work for us. So in the communities where we work, every um, ETOD that we support comes with a community table that has decided that that's what the community wants. And it's often managed by a trusted community organization, an organizing group like Logan Square Neighborhood Association or Garfield Park Community Council or Foundation for a Common Square um, and the Leo Institute. Many others come together and they tell us this is something that we want you to bring to our community, Elevate it. So we invest in whatever they want. Some of them came to the table and said we need affordable housing and we need it 100% to be affordable or we need a community land trust like the stay, um, the, the, the here to stay in Hermosa and that's what we uh, supported. In Garfield Park, community said, we want community ownership here. We don't wanna be engaged. We wanna own a stake on this mixed income uh, a project that POA in this case uh, is building. So that's the part that we are financing is the portion of the development that is gonna be for small businesses it from uh, the community uh, near transit. In Homer and Harrison mm -hmm. community said, uh, we need space. We need uh, an event or a, or a restaurant space or something for the community to enjoy. And this is how much money we need. And that's what we uh, supported there. Also in Homer Square, community residents came and said, we don't have enough um, in units of housing that are accessible mm -hmm. to people with disabilities. So what's the point of having a CTA station that is accessible if the homes nearby are not. So that's what the portion that we funded. So again, it's very hyper-localized and it's very community driven and it's very different from other larger larger um, efforts uh, in Chicago. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of trust building and a lot of listening. And it's not always what um, the market wants and it's not always what the uh, mayor wants. And so it's not always what those bigger places want, but it's the way that we, we decide where to go. Thank you, uh, Roberto. 
um, this will be our last question. Uh, thank you for a uh, very fine presentation to all of you. I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Village of Beltair versus Boras, uh, 416 U.S. 1, in 1974, uh, and this was a liberal court, the Warren Court, upheld single-family zoning against a claim by a uh, gentleman who owned the home and was leasing it to unrelated college students as kind of a, a boarding house. And they held that the village could enforce its ordinance against the landlord and uh, keep him from, uh, in fact, uh, renting the house in that way. Uh, and as part of their rationale, they lauded the idea of single family residential. Uh, they thought it created quiet neighborhoods, et cetera. Uh, and after World War II, the philosophy of many people was to get out of the city and to build a home. It was a dream to own a home. And I believe that for many people today, it is a dream to own a single family home, not to be living in an apartment building. Uh, so to the extent you're talking about greater density, it seems to me you're dealing with cultural, uh, philosophical, social, and political issues uh, that have far greater ramifications. And uh, most zoning is really determined by the social, political, uh, and cultural views of the people in the community who in fact pass the laws through their village boards uh, as to what their zoning is gonna be. So I'd be interested in your uh, comments regarding quiet neighborhoods uh, and places that uh, were, in fact, lauded back in 1974 when this case was decided. Well, a lot of things have changed since then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Chicago has continuously downzoned um, over uh, since its first zoning code. So if you go back and look at the zoning maps and the zoning code, oh my gosh, when was our first one? Like 1923, I think, was our first one. Um, and then you compare it to the one in the 1940s, and then you compare it to the one in 1957, and then you compare it to the one in 2004. So we're currently operating under the 2004 zoning code. Uh, so that means from 1957 to 2004, we basically had one zoning code. Um, we should not be waiting that long to change our policies. Um, but 1957 allowed more density uh, across the city than 2004 and present. Um, and so I don't really want to rely on the 1957 zoning code, which, which I appreciate because it allowed more density than current. Um, but it's just like, like I said, things, things change. And then I think we are ripe for change in Chicago. Um, I loved uh, hearing about the Minneapolis experience. Um, I want to borrow some things from, from what they did. Uh, but like the, 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 the reason like the Supreme Court probably went that way, uh, I don't know anything else about the case except from what you just told me, um, is that, that they, are, they were upholding a federal government policy that had been in place for uh, like 60 years by that time. And so they were just kind of like keeping things the same. Uh, and, and I hope that we've moved on since then. Uh, that we don't need to keep um, racism as a legally mandated policy anymore.